gate to crack and crackheads. Wow, eight seven. Okay. Well, let's get to it. Um, I'm not necessarily going to hit all the high points because uh, many of actually it looks like only three of us were alive when all this was happening. But that's the idea to talk about what was going on because just like when it, as I like to have as a regular feature torn from the headlines, I don't know how many consume news media in various forms. Uh, whether you trust them or not, it's always good to know what the dominant story is, even if it's a lie. It's good to know what the lies are, and to be able to tell them apart. All right? So, torn from the headlines, part of the doctrine of love your enemies is listening to your critics, particularly when their critique is accurate. So a critique is when you basically list not only the good, but the bad of either a particular argument or a person or uh, anything that you are uh, essentially making a critique of. So critique is not just good and not just bad, but kind of like an analysis using a particular framework. Um, of a particular person, place, or thing, or work of art. So, political dirty tricks can become business as usual regardless of who is in power. So, for example, in the last couple of days, uh, the revelations that the IRS monitored conservatives is no different than when the IRS, FBI, CIA, the intelligence community, etc., monitored civil rights, black power, brown power, red power, yellow power, gray power, anti-war movement on the left. It's no different. But then, they were doing it in secret, and it wasn't discoverable, and you know, now we have enabled, now it's you know, headline news within, you know, within a year of when it happened. So at the time in the 70s, being part of, you know, essentially getting radicalized myself in 1968, the day after Martin Luther King got shot. Um, at the time in the 70s and being part of the anti-war movement, loosely part of the civil rights movement, we never imagined the government considered us a threat to the degree that it did. So, for example, you know, I went, basically lived in what was demonstrably called the ghetto, but I was going to West Side, mostly white schools, hang out with a lot of white kids who were kind of lefty, liberal, Jewish, or if they're not Jewish, then uh, they're on the left, because that was who was comfortable to hang out with, because at the time, when you're dealing with, for example, athletes, athletes were always conservative basically the ones that were going to, you know, actually join the reserve off the ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps, and, you know, they were volunteering to go to Vietnam. And my dad was a vet and said, no, you're not going to Vietnam, it's not your war, no Vietnam Cong ever called you nigger, it's not your fight, we're down with Muhammad Ali, what's the point in going to fight for freedom in Vietnam if I can't go to the beach in Florida, if I can't buy a house wherever I want if I have the money? Good logic, right? There are good beaches in Vietnam. Uh, yeah, there are good beaches in Vietnam, but I'm not sure if I like the surfing there. Yeah. In any case. <laughs> Love sharks. <laughs> the part of the piece was looking at, okay, we were young, and we were talking about being revolutionary and all that kind of stuff, but none of us even owned guns or even fired a gun, even though we might have had a copy of the Anarchist Cookbook. It was kind of like a collector's item, not that we actually read it and learned how to make bombs, so there were people who learned how to do that kind of stuff. Was that, so, excuse me, was that Kurt Saxon? Yeah, yeah, that book, right, Big Black. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. that's yeah. It's right. amazing. So, you know, even though we went to anti-war marches, even though we did get FBI files, I haven't seen mine. I know that I have one because a friend of mine who is a... Um, public defender in New York basically said, have you seen your FBI file? And I go, why would I have an FBI file? We said, well, I did Freedom of Information, I asked for mine and one for the CIA who said that they didn't have it. So 
he said, assume that it's redacted, but that file, the fact that all the stuff that they had on me means they got stuff on YouTube. Okay, cool. Let me get free of my tax stuff before I ask for it, just in case the FBI and the IRS talk to each other, which they do, apparently. <laughs> right? So, we never imagined that the government considered us a threat. Because, wow, you know, yeah, we're talking revolution, but we don't actually have guns. We're just talking. Right? We don't know and know of people that are doing more than just talking. But, you know, for us, Angela Davis and all those other folks were role models because, well, she's a professor. But, you know, not necessarily per per participating in armed, necessarily, insurrection or whatever. So, it's not simply that it considered us a threat, but that, that to say us can be you. Can be you. All right? But what the government did, that is, breaking the law to do it, to basically, you know, watch us, stealing elections, spying on Americans who are not a threat to the country, but a threat to the party in power, which is not the same. So the party in power is not the country. It's just part of the country. But if they consider themselves aligned with the country, that can become dangerous in itself. Especially if you're opposed to them. Especially if you are for the rule of law, and they're breaking the law while being in power. And that can happen on either side, right? Because the system allows for that. So, for example, um, I was looking at uh, the death of Geronimo Pratt. Uh, when Geronimo died last, uh, two years ago in uh, Africa, basically being wrongly imprisoned, essentially by government informants lying on the stand the DA, the police department, and all these folks knew that this guy was lying on the stand and allowed it to go through and wrongly imprisoned this person for the death of someone where they knew because of FBI surveillance because Geronimo Pratt was essentially a Black Panther, but he was a Black Panther who was a leader be specifically because of his military experience and saying, okay, y'all need some military discipline. Here, if you're talking about revolution, okay, you need to understand what that means from a military perspective and keep your act together and do the things that you need to do. And so he was a Vietnam vet, highly decorated Vietnam vet, who basically, you know, came back and started working on uh, Black Panther Party work. And he was up in Oakland. The surveillance knew, the police surveillance knew that he was in Oakland, yet he was convicted of a murder of a woman uh, several hundred miles away in Los Angeles uh, without being matched to evidence. They didn't have DNA evidence, but you know, basically a police informant said that he was there and did the shooting, which, okay, what's the motivation for the shooting? What's the physical evidence? He's convicted essentially bogusly, even though they knew he didn't do the murder and spent 27 years in prison behind that because of who he was and what he did, right? So he's kind of like our uh, one, uh, our version of Nelson Mandela. So in this interview, uh, which is on Democracy Now!, which uh, they interview uh, his lawyers and also uh, Johnny Cochran was one of Geronimo's lawyers. Uh, they point out that the new enemy could be you, and he's talking about in the context of Muslims or anybody, whoever is considered an enemy. So, when we, where we justify killing, imprisonment, without trial, law-abiding American citizens at home and abroad. So, for example, it's one thing to uh, kill Anwar al-Awlaki because he's part of Al-Qaeda and a publicist for Al-Qaeda. It's another thing to kill his kid, who's 16. Right, who at 16 years old, you know, killed by a drone strike. Yeah, we, we signed treaties so we're not supposed to tackle for borders, foreign borders, too. Yeah, but, you know, this kid is killed in a cafe, so without due process, and he was born here. He's an American citizen. So where do you draw the line about who can be killed? Now, this was done overseas, but there's a drone program domestically here in the United States. 
So it's, you know, as Bill Maher talked about, look, don't worry about Obama taking your guns. What good are your guns are if <laughs> it's a drone strike and they decide they can bomb you or take you out? So uh, we covered the Martin Luther King assassination a little bit, but I want to uh, cover a part of it that I didn't talk about. Uh, this is from the dust jacket of a book. Um, So this is in a book called An Act of State. So Government Act of States. William Pepper, attorney and friend of Dr. King and the King family, became convinced after years of investigation that not only was James Earl Ray not the shooter, but that King had been targeted as part of a larger conspiracy to stop the anti-war movement and prevent King from gaining momentum in his promising poor people's campaign. Ten years into his investigation in 1988, Pepper agreed to represent James Earl Ray. While he was never able to successfully appeal the sentence before Ray's death, he was able to build an airtight case against the real perpetrators. In 1999, Lower Joyers, Lloyd Jowers, and co-conspirators were brought to trial in a wrongful death civil action on behalf of the King family. Basically, all they wanted was essentially the facts to come out, and they asked for $100 damages to bury the body, which of course the body was already buried. So basically just to prove a larger point. 70 witnesses set out the details of a conspiracy and a plot to murder King that involved J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, Richard Helms and the CIA, the military, local Memphis police, and organized crime figures from New Orleans and Memphis. The evidence was unimpeachable. The jury took an hour to find for the King family but the silence following these shocking revelations was, revelations was deafening. Like the pattern during all the investigations of the assassination through the years, no major media outlet would cover the story. It was effectively buried. Now, at trial, they determined that, yes, in fact, the government killed Dr. King. No news media at all proven in a court of law. 1999, right? So if this is the first time you've heard that, it's not a conspiracy theory, proven in a court of law. So part of the piece then, if they're going after Martin Luther King, then theoretically, who's you know, non-violent, leading a social movement to essentially have environmental justice, what else could they do? So Watergate, we used to start here, so I'm just setting up in terms of looking at uh, the conditions for today, Watergate, a Republican law and order president takes a fall after it's revealed he broke the law to get elected and to get essentially re-elected. He was elected in 68, uh, put in place the current drug laws and put in place um, the conspiracy laws which are in, play, in effect a place that will set up um, or what happens later on in terms of um, uh, the drug war, the war on drugs. So Watergate proved that the apparatus of government must not be underestimated in how it can be used because it might not necessarily be who's in top. Who's it? Sometimes the apparatus of government can be used without the knowledge of the top people. But in the case of Watergate, without even plausible deniability. Now, plausible deniability is a term of art used in intelligence and government circles, which means that underlings can carry things out, and unless you knew about it directly, unless there's evidence that you ordered it directly, you can't be blamed, so the underlings can take a fall. Plausible. Oh, I didn't know. How could I know? There's no physical evidence connecting me. Now, the Nixon conspiracy laws, which basically go like this. If you are the head of a drug organization, and I as an underling commit a murder, they can use the conspiracy laws, all they have to do is say that we're part of the same organization, and even if you'd had no prior knowledge, you can be convicted of murder one. That I did. And that's how they use that to take down entire drug dealing organizations using the laws that Nixon put into place. The whole conspiracy laws piece, right? 
So this law and order president basically, you know, plausible deniability doesn't work. All I have to do is prove that you're part of the same organization. But somehow they get exempt from those kind of rulings themselves. So one example of a very curious phenomenon, I mention it just because it happened, uh, and it resulted, you know, the only way that it affected me personally was I couldn't get uh, a particular piece of music for a long time. Um, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But the SLA, the Symbionese Liberation Army. Tunnel to Freeze. Yeah. So the SLA was a 1970s multiracial militant group with the broad slogan, death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. Now I was in college when they had their communique. The group was founded in Berkeley in 73 by Donald DeFries, who escaped from San Quentin in 73, changed his name to Sin-Q Matune, sin -Q after the uh, leader of the Amistad Rebellion on the slave ship uh, in which uh, the Africans took over the, slave, uh, the slavers and uh, attempted to sail themselves back to Africa. The group said the name Symbionese referred to a different, different people living in harmony. They chose as a symbol the Naga, a seven-headed cobra. Now, using this symbology and making up words, symbionese, like symbionotic, symb symbiotic, ease, right? You're basically <laughs> doing an act of creation that is essentially say, trying to set yourself apart from people, uh, from uh, the separations that naturally occur in society, and that theoretically you're revolting against that. Their first significant act was the November 6, 73 murder of Dr. Marcus Foster, superintendent of Oakland Public Schools. So he was the first African American to hold the post of superintendent of schools in Oakland. Uh, so one wonders, and we often wonder at the time because when we, uh, my family first heard about it, my father's best man at his wedding was assistant superintendent, and we thought it was him that had gotten shot, but it turned out to be a Marcus. And so Marcus was the first black superintendent of Oakland, which uh, whether people necessarily relate to that at the time, that is a, was a big deal, to have black firsts. So the SLA claimed that Foster was assassinated for his support of photo ID cards for Oakland high school students. They claimed that he was a CIA agent and the ID program was intended to be a method of surveillance. He actually had previously withdrawn his support for, for the ID program. So they're op operating on faulty information and basing a murder on that. 74, they kidnapped a 19-year-old Berkeley history major newspaper heiress Patricia Hurst, Patty Hurst, Angela Atwood, Donald DeFries, and Bill Harris broke into an apartment where she and her fiancé lived. Uh, her boyfriend was assaulted, and she was thrown in the trunk of a car. They released an audio recording in which Patty Hearst said she was joining the forces of the SLA. She announced she was changing her name to Tanya. Along with the tape was a picture of Hearst holding a machine gun in front of an SLA ba banner. Uh, she participated uh, in a bank uh, robbery. Hibernia Bank. Hibernia Bank. This is a picture of the, a group picture of the SLA, kind of grainy because it's low res. Who are they? Huh? Who are they? Oh, they're multiracial. Black, white. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Rob Banks. Yes. For revolutionary purposes. So, Bill and Emily, his wife, uh, were caught shoplifting ammunition in the sporting goods store. They got into an altercation with the security guard. Hearst emerged from the van. Uh, the three drove to the store, fired a machine gun, affecting the escape of the Harrises. Parking ticket found in the abandoned van eventually led to authorities tracking their whereabouts. DeFries and five other members of the SLA were killed in a battle with police in LA at an SLA safe house. Incinerated. Incinerated, right. 
Hearst and the Harrises at the time were in a motel room near Disneyland in Anaheim. That's Tanya with her machine gun from the SLA banner. Surviving members robbed a Crocker bank in Carmichael. A bank customer was killed there during the robbery during the next several months. They committed a series of robbers, robberies, pipe bombs, and police cars through surveillance. The FBI was able to find them. Uh, after her arrest, Patty maintained her um, defense or uh, allegiance to the SLA. During the trial, her uh, lawyer said that she was uh, brainwashed by the SLA in a phenomenon called Stockholm Syndrome, where the victim of a kidnapping comes to uh, basically take on or identify with their captors and then switch sides. Jury convicted her and she received a seven year sentence. Two years later, she received a pardon from President Carter. And she married her FBI guard. And married her FBI, what was it, bodyguard or? He was, yeah. Just, yeah, he was guarding her during the trial. Yeah. You, you, you didn't mention that the SLA in order to, what was it, in order to deal with uh, the hearse, made him give away a million dollars worth of food to the poor on the streets of Oakland. Right, you know. right, right. So, you know, in thinking about these folks in retrospect, so this is probably one of the first examples in modern times, certainly uh, within my memory, of what I call, or what is now called media conscious terrorists. Now, Terrorism is really meaningless without attention of some kind. When it's used to gain attention for a particular cause, the people committing it have generally been driven to that out of a sense of frustration. If you're going to basically see, say that as a, as a, a positive and so that you could work to prevent terrorism by actually creating conditions out of which it doesn't arise by basically having, you know, as President Kennedy once said, if you make viol uh, positive, peaceful uh, revolution impossible, you make violent revolution inevitable. The question becomes, will that action ultimately achieve their stated goals? Probably not. It's probably the wrong there, too. But there's a question as to whether the SLA was also not an intelligence community set up from the beginning. Certainly on leftist sides, like they're kind of unorganized. Why are you doing all these things? And yeah, you get hers to give a million dollars to the, in food to the poor, but how does that change actual conditions? So coming to the 80s. Cracks in the grass, glass ceiling and crack in the glass pipe. And I'll explain both of those things. So often when we start seeing um, in a system where discrimination has been the rule of law, one of the symbols of things changing is when you get um, integration into the upper echelons of power. Now this is usually symbolic because just because you have a head of a particular government, you're basically not necessarily changing the infrastructure that makes up that government. But progress, Harold Washington. Harold was uh, born in uh, Chicago, Cook County Hospital, and uh, attended public schools, Bachelor of Arts at Roosevelt University, and a ju Juris Doctor from Northwestern Law School in 52. When his father died, he uh, took over his father's position as precinct captain, which if you're not familiar with electoral politics, essentially cities are broken up into precincts, and these precincts are responsible for getting out the vote. Now, Chicago, had been a long time Democratic uh, stronghold where the Democratic machine for at least going on a century before that had turned out specific candidates with no small degree of corruption. Richard Daly. Okay, which like Richard Daly and uh, the other folks before him. So usually they elected white candidates. So what happened here, and this is where uh, 
not that they talked about this with uh, the president being a community organizing, community organizer. Community organizers in Chicago elected the first black mayor, and that's Harold Washington. So Harold Washington basically got into power as a result of black community organizing among itself to produce a different result against the uh, democratic machine. So he's a re reformed Democrat. He upset the Chicago Democratic Party machine when he was elected mayor and then reelected. Unfortunately, died of a heart attack. Of natural causes, we hope. Also, symbolic progress, running for president, even though Jesse Jackson wasn't the first uh, black person to run for president on the national level. Um, he, you know, he didn't win, he put up an impressive total of delegates, more than Shirley Chisholm, who was actually one of the first black people to run for president, especially as a woman in 1972. Um, now, when we talked about, uh, when I talked about last week about black candidates before Obama not being quote unquote electable, this is one of the examples that are given. Uh, Jesse Jackson, usually who becomes president, um, and you could actually do this analysis on your own, how many of them are lawyers? How many of them are governors or senators? And when they talk about not being electable, how many, because theoretically, anybody can become president if they garner the votes, theoretically, right? But the reality is, you have to have, you become stronger when you have some kind of elected office, really strong if it's like governor or senator, because you're basically controlling a state or at the national level, and then, or as a congressman. Being a businessman, there are presidents who've been elected as businessmen, but they're rare. So, Jesse Jackson, just essentially a minister, who uh, there are some who would basically say unfairly took on the mantle of Martin Luther King, uh, who wasn't even president at Martin's assassination, who came and, you know, got Martin's bloody shirt and put it on him and started talking about uh, how he was torn up about Martin and taking on that, manual, that mantle, some people say falsely. In any case, Jesse Jackson uh, became symbolic in terms of running for president uh, in 84 and 88, and while well, has some good quotes, um, again, it's symbolic. So in the 1980s, special news report, journalist Peter Jennings investigates America's drug problem and examines a variety of solutions to the social ban, including legalization and stiffer jail terms for drug peddlers. The film provide, which is a, a basically an hour long, hour two hour long special uh, during prime time. It provided viewers with a first-hand look at the seedy side of drug dealing. This is from the, actually uh, ABC's website, where Jennings takes the viewers to street corners, school lots, parks, and other places in large and small towns where illegal drugs are sold, where gangs and guns are part of the culture. Will the modern plague devour the potential of America's youth, or will the affliction be controlled? Well, in the 80s, we know the answer to that now, in the early part of the 21st century. No. But what struck me at the time when this came out is that when Peter Jennings put up this map of the country and said, drugs, why this plague? One of the things I noticed is that everywhere of the, the map that lit up, it's following the interstate system. Now, why that is, is because I pointed out that you have to look at, okay, where does a drug problem come from? What does it take to support a drug problem? And it talks about drugs, why this plague? Drug dealing gangs are taking over the United States. Okay, how are they doing that? Because actually being a drug counselor for gangs in Los Angeles, 
I happened to notice that, wait, these, the stereotype was black drug dealing gangs, right? Well, they don't speak Spanish. How are they getting cocaine? How's cocaine getting into the country for them to sell? Who is bringing it? How is that happening? Hmm. They didn't talk about that. Who are the people in the best position to bring those drugs? And who are the, yeah, right. How are they being supplied? Where are they getting the guns, etc.? Corporations. Not corporations. Before we get to that, there are two, there is a system of discrimination, institutional discrimination, uh, usually referred to in terms of uh, women. This is usually how uh, the glass ceiling is described. So, two different forms of uh, the same thing, glass ceiling and also the sticky floor. So, this illustration, the glass ceiling. So, you have people who are doing, you know, what's referred to as manual labor or also menial labor. So, you have a cook, you have a person on the manufacturing line, you have a janitor type person who are on the bottom floor, and then there's a glass ceiling, and then you have people who you can tell by their dress are more professional, that is, they're doing work with their mind, right? And then there's people above them. So this person is looking down on those folks, and these two people are looking up at folks that we don't necessarily see, and they're all separated by a glass ceiling. Now, the glass ceiling not only is a metaphor, but it's also a re reality about social stratification. So, the glass, it's as if you can look up at the people above you, but you can't ever get there. And once you're above, if you do somehow make it to be on top of a glass ceiling, you can look down at those folks uh, and but still aspire to move upward, but not necessarily questioning the structure that keeps you separated. So you can think of what I like to think of the glass ceiling as, it's like a one-way mirror. That is, you can look up and see the people above you, but when they look down, all they see is a mirror that reflects themselves. So the glass ceiling is a means of keeping stratification in place, the sticky floor is a means of keeping you at the same level so you can't move up. Okay, there are pattern forms of type six isms, so social structural violence, usually affecting women and minorities in their attempts to rise up in the power hierarchy in corporate, governmental, or academic institutions. This particular graphic, basically, especially when you Google on the image of, uh, use Google image and say glass ceiling, sticky floor, this particular, for years the little woman was a homemaker who was forced by convention to work in the few professions open to women. The talent that went to waste because of gender repression is astounding. Male-run companies refuse to allow women to rise past a certain controllable point. This point is often called a glass ceiling. So even though she may be wearing the trappings of um, corporate power, you know, suit and tie, et cetera, et cetera, basically her gender, or she's basically relegated to a certain position by her gender and her physical body, which is basically, with this particular image, basically she's naked except with the overlay of clothing. The idea is, oh, well, you're just a sex object, no matter what you are within this particular framework. It's glass ceiling and sticky floor. Okay? Woman trying to satisfy her professional goals is made to feel naked and exposed to the repression of her, her ambition by those who secretly fear a woman will rise to a position of authority, which is basically one of the phenomena we see in terms of women running for president. So we can see women being President in, for example, television, but not necessarily in reality. Yeah. And you notice that they, they're using the 
right wingers are using the uh, Hillary Clinton's what happened in Benghazi to right. see to stop her from being elected. Still yeah. As an attempt to stop, you know, oh, well, you're not qualified for leadership. Well, they could also cop to Benghazi was a black site. But they're not going to do that because that's national security. All right, skill will eventually triumph, and it is increasingly possible to shatter the glass ceiling. You go, girl, so to speak. So, the geopolitics of cocaine production. This comes out of um, an analysis that I called, uh, you're familiar with, the strings of the Cora, in which you look at a particular problem and you analyze the history of it as well as the economics of it. Now, drug dealing gangs are basically driven by survival, but they evolved from somewhere. They didn't come out of nowhere. So geopolitics of cocaine production go like this. Coca was originally grown in the mountainous Andes. Now, if you recall when I was talking about in the construct of axiochemistry, a substance starts out as a medicine in its native culture and then can be used as a sacrament. And then maybe a source of leisure, maybe a commodity, etc. Right? Coca is a shrub that basically grows... Um, in, originally grew in the mountainous Andes, and it contains a substance that we have isolated and called cocaine. Originally grown in the Andes. So, it's not nice, that's coca, the coca berries. Traditionally has been used by native peoples in South America. Leaves are chewed, sometimes mixed with ash, uh, lime, not the fruit, but the chemical, enhances absorption of the drug. So a mouthful of coca leaf delivers a dose of cocaine roughly equivalent to a cup, cup of coffee. So raw coca leaf. So you can basically take, say, a tenth of the leaves that are pictured in this picture, mix them with um, ash, uh, and, um, and chew them. It's actually fairly bitter. Because it tastes good. Doesn't taste good at all, probably about seven on the peyote scale. You'd have, and, to, really, uh, you'd have to get used to it. Yeah. So, roughly equivalent to a co cup of coffee. In other words, uh, if I were to illustrate it, let's say this is normal, take a cup of coffee or a mouthful of coca, you have a mood hill. I might drop it a little below, but you'll be uh, basically more or less normal the next day. So, meaning, if you don't have a cup of coffee, you'll live, unless you're addicted. So, the dose provides a behavioral stimulant dose of cocaine. That is, you're able to do work, you're awake, so it's not an elevated move spike as with nose cocaine, which, with nose cocaine, if you understand that a thousand pounds of coca leaf with sulfuric acid, kerosene, and a bunch of other chemicals come, translates into a pound of cocaine. Essentially, when you're doing two lines of cocaine or a rock of cocaine, you're essentially doing the entire cocaine output of several bushes at once, which you never do physically, so it produces a mood spike. And what goes up must come down, so that basically feeds part of the addiction. This is from a CIA kids website. Indians and miners who live in the mountains have chewed coca for centuries to overcome the effects to the high altitudes. Coca is also used in toothpaste, tea, and medicines, which is true then, true to some degree now, because cocaine is still used in Coca-Cola, original flavor of Coke. Coke is a small shrub, so single plant could survive a person with several mouthful of leaves for about a week. At this point, the natural form of the plant, there's a limit imposed by how many mouthful of leaves you can chew. 
thus limiting the amount of drug you can take in its natural form, thus limiting how addicted you could be. Okay, CIA website states that, depending on the country we're grown, coca leaves from a hectare field, a little more than an acre, can be processed into 4.0 to 7.4 kilograms, about 8 to 16 pounds of cocaine. So let's say it takes a thousand pounds of leaf to be processed in a cocaine, into a pound of cocaine. Even doing a single line or rock of cocaine is more cocaine than in several bushes, as I've said before. So the addiction factor is multiplied from processed cocaine uh, over natural coca leaf. The drug effect is essentially a mood spike rather than the gentle rise of a cup of coffee. And you can also make this case, this analogy, working for other drugs as well. So for example, the addiction factor is multiplied. So this is true for all the cocaine preparations from uh, prior to the Harrison Narcotics Act that we talked about uh, last week. Coca-Cola Classic is still made with cocaine. So for example, this is the original Coke recipe from 1905. 30 pounds of sugar, two gallons of water, so think about 30 pounds of sugar developed, dissolved into two gallons of water, two pints of lime juice, four ounces of citrate of caffeine, uh, two ounces of citric acid, ounce of extract of vanilla, six drams, three quarters of an ounce of fluid extract of cola from Africa, six drams of fluid extract of coca, carbonated water to taste, and then maybe you you basically make the syrup from that because that's going to be fa fairly thick if you understand how much sugar <laughs> to liquid that is. <laughs> but think about even if you dilute that, uh, how nasty the coca -Cola, cocaine and the cola has to be for you to put that much sugar. Yeah? If you take that syrup, you drop it on the floor and burn a hole in the floor too. Yeah, right, because of the phosphoric acid, yeah, among other things. It's yeah. a recipe for poison. So yeah. All right, so 10 pounds of leaf to produce the cocaine needed for 36 gallons of, of syrup. Because cocaine is so bitter tasting, great deal of sugar is required. Purpose to show that recipe, so for example, when I was Churchill High School's drug counselor in the 80s, uh, someone's grandmother required actually two six-packs of Coca-Cola today in 1905. Would we consider that a drug problem? Because this is when Coca-Cola had cocaine in it. So two six-packs a day of Coca-Cola. I mean, we'd actually consider that a drug problem today, even if it's just sugar. But two six-packs of Coke then, right? And it was legal, right? The inventor of Coca-Cola was a morphine-addicted pharmacist. Why are we not surprised? So part of one of the things I bring in with the Iranian Revolution here, the popular revolution overthrew the U.S.-backed Shah of Iran, replacing him with an Islamic state, the current one that's in power now. Head of that state at the time was Ayatollah Khomeini. The U.S. Embassy captured, scores of hostages were held for 444 days. What was referred to as the October Surprise, more than 3,000 Israeli militants stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, taking 66 Americans hostage and setting the stage for a showdown in the United States, uh, some of them were gotten out in the events depicted in the movie Argo with Ben Affleck. So naturally, the Carter administration tried to secure the release of hostages through overt and covert means. One covert military rescue attempt ended in disaster in the desert, um, the operation called Desert One. It was a defining moment for President Carter because uh, the, attempt, the rescue attempt uh, was 
Uh, it, it failed because of uh, mechanical failures uh, to the aircraft. So the October surprise was talked about um, at, at the time. Uh, technically, for example, a sitting president has, has the power to negotiate with a foreign power. Carter was running for a re-election against Ronald Reagan. The Reagan team didn't want Carter to pull off what he w was referred to as an October surprise, that is, a release of the Iranian-held American hostages in October before the November elections, and then which would have ensured the election for Carter. So both sides, both the Carter side and the Reagan team were trying to negotiate a hostage release. So technically, it was illegal for the Republicans to have teams in Europe negotiating with the Iranians for the release of hostages, which they did. So they were breaking the law, right? The precedent set not just with Watergate, but Watergate was the most obvious example of presidents sitting in power to essentially break the law to maintain that power. So it was illegal for the Republicans to have teams in Europe negotiating with the Iranians. So this also involved arms. That is, only the United States government is supposed to have arms to arm, be able to negotiate arms deals with other countries. So it was illegal for the Republican team to actually negotiate arms for hostages. Iran was at war with Iraq, which was then led by the US-backed Saddam Hussein, which we won't get back to get into just yet. But the U United States, Saddam was on the CIA payroll um, and was backed by the United States uh, to be in power. So, a deal was negotiated by the Reagan team. Uh, Carter lost the election. The Iranians released the hostage on Re Reagan's inauguration. There's a link for that. So the Reagan years. So Reagan, as a drug counselor, the Reagan years are characterized by the phrase, just say no. So as I've said before here, and just to put it up uh, officially, when Nancy Reagan was saying just say no, 80% of the illegal drug users in America were white men who made in excess of $50,000. Combined, combined minority usage was 13% with blacks making up less than 5% of that usage. This is from the household survey. So guess who, of course, did the time for that? So, contradiction. So, the contradiction goes like this. When Peter Jennings talks about drugs, why, why this plague? Just to make a turbulent long story short, we were, uh, Republicans were still fighting uh, what is referred to as a Cold War, and part of the Cold War was uh, stopping communism or anything remotely like communism or stopping anything that resembled a democratic uh, elected government that may or may not be hostile to um, US business interests. So for example, does anyone know the reference to Banana Republic other than the store chain? Well, a banana republic. You may notice in America, bananas don't grow anywhere in America except like in Hawaii. Yet you have bananas year round. Why is that? And who owns the banana companies? You may not have ever thought about that. You may just walk through the mall and see, oh, Banana Republic, where did that come from? Well, that was actually a racist term, but what that means is that companies like United Fruit 
dole, etc., will go to places where it's a majority minority country and then have cheap labor so that you can have bananas year round. So even if your bananas cost 70, 79 cents a pound, they can pay the workers a nickel a day so that you can have bananas year round for 79 cents a pound. Now what if the workers say, we can't live on a nickel a day? What are they going to do? Well, what would Americans do? There's other places to find people that will. Well, there are, but what if American workers wanted to organize into labor unions to strike for higher pay? What if they, what, what, well, what happened here is that people violently reacted against people forming unions. People died. You like the weekend? You like minimum wage? People died for that here in this country. They didn't just give you the weekend. They didn't just give you minimum wage. People died for those things after unionizing and fighting for them. So in other countries, what happened is that if the banana workers decided we want to get six cents an hour or a dime an hour, they were violently suppressed by these private businesses, including United Front and United Food and Dole. So part of that piece, just like we saw in Hawaii with Dole, People were working under slavery conditions. People in Hawaii were being whipped in the sugar fields in the 1930s. Okay, so these so-called banana republics, what they were was United Front Fruit and Dole would ask the United States government to send in the Marines to suppress workers organizing for better wages and working conditions. Kill the workers and then put in a friendly government, a business friendly government, hence a banana republic. That's where that term came from. Okay, so that the United States would put in a government that was business friendly so that you could have bananas year round. One of those places was Nicaragua. Okay, so Sandino of Nicaragua led a revolt against the United States Marines. The Marines lost, and Sandino was on his way to negotiate a peace contract and was assassinated by the Marines on the way, on the steps of the building where he was going to sign the armistice where the Marines had lost. Well, it turns out who wins is who's alive at the end of the day. So, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua were part of that movement. Popular elected government that wasn't necessarily hostile to American business interests, but saying, let's have something more equitable. Like, why don't we control our own resources? Very similar to, uh, and I guess when I mentioned the Shah, the Shah was put in place after a popularly elected Iranian Prime Minister Mossadegh basically attempted to nationalize Iranian oil, saying, look, why should British Petroleum get 80% of the profit from our oil? Why don't we get 60% and y'all get 40%? What year was that uh, Sandino assassinated? Sandino was assassinated, I believe, in the 30s. 30s. Yeah. Okay, so in case this shows up on a final news,